The next Caravaggisti we're going to study is Diego Velázquez, who's a Spanish painter, and he's painting during the Baroque era. And what makes him a Caravaggisti is basically his use of chiaroscuro and tenebrism. You can see that there's a strong light that's raking across this, this uh, canvas, and which you can see it actually kind of makes patterns of light and shadow on the faces and on the figures themselves. The next thing that I think is uh, shows the chiaroscuro is if you look at the vases or the pots that the characters have, you can actually identify the highlight, the transitional and uh, core and reflected light in all of these things. The tenebrism that's used is, you know, it moves from the foreground to the middle ground to the background. The tenebrism is especially pronounced in that back figure who who's, uh, has a cup up to his face where he almost literally dissolves into the background. And the shoulders of the middle figure dissolve and that's part of tenebrism. We also have this spotlighting, which is tenebrism. It's a sort of heightened chiaroscuro that makes things more dramatic and more um, interesting. There's also a kind of diagonal created by the light and uh, shadow that's running through this. And so it, you can actually see it sort of runs a diagonal through the picture plane. And that's part of what Caravaggio did an awful lot in his compositions. There are other things that he does that are very much like Caravaggio. For instance, the genre kinds of uh, elements in it, where this is an everyday person in, the, in this painting, and it's actually a scene of everyday life. And we'll approach that and talk about the content or the iconography in a minute, in, a, in, a, in just a second. First of all, since it's one of his first known paintings or a painting that he's very much known for, he studied in Sevilla with two masters. His first master was Francisco Herrera, and then the second one was Francisco Pacheco, and he actually married Pacheco's daughter. Um, by about 1622, just after that, he actually has traveled to Madrid and becomes, uh, you know, Philip IV becomes his patron, and he works mainly in the Spanish court. And we'll talk about why that's important in a minute. In terms of the content of this painting, oh my God, you know, for a first painting, this is incredible. And I think Velázquez is one of the um, greatest painters that ever lived, if not the greatest painter, at least in my estimation. Uh, this is a genre scene, right? So it's a scene of everyday life. But the genre that this painting is, is called a bodegon, or uh, the plural of that is bodegones. And it's basically a sort of tavern or a scene of a kitchen scene. That's what a bodegon is, more or less. And in the past, bodegons would have been scenes that were primarily designed to be sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek and, and uh, weren't very sympathetic and were almost showing low-life tavern life in Spanish painting. But what Velázquez does is he actually uses it actually in a more Christian, a more humanistic way. And what he's showing you is, well, actually this still goes on today. If you go to Mexico City, one of my students was telling me there are people who actually sell little little uh, bags and bottles of water out on the street in Mexico for, when, for people who can't get to water. And it's basically a form of begging. And that's what this guy is doing. He would carry around pots of water and we see, uh, several pots of water because these pots, these clay pots, would actually sort of strain and purify the water as they ran through each other. An unglazed pot would, uh, it would be fired but unglazed, and that would allow water to sort of uh, go through the pot and would take out impurities and that kind of thing. And then this guy would basically sell you a cup of water for, I guess, like the equivalent of a couple of pennies or a nickel or a quarter today. Um, and it would be a way that if you were someone who was better off than this guy, because he's basically kind of almost a beggar, I, I suppose you would say, you could buy a, a glass of water from him and help him out. Now, in terms of Christian theology, especially at this point in time, Velazquez does paintings of, uh, of people like this, street people, and there, there's a whole genre of genre scene showing uh, sort of the beggar class of people. And the reason for this is these people, uh, according to the grand design, uh, were put on the planet more or less to help us because they allow us to do charitable works and they allow us to give things like uh, money for a glass of water and we can help them and it reminds us to do the good works that the Catholic and Christian Church has instructed us to do. Now another um, interpretation of this painting 
is probably that, um, I don't necessarily agree with this one, but it's it's good for you to know it, that it might be the three ages of man, that we've got sort of a, a, a young boy on the left-hand side who's taking that glass of water, then we've got sort of the middle age in the, the guy in the middle of the picture, and then an old man uh, on the right-hand side, and that would be like the three ages of man to show aging. And that might be another interpretation of it. Some other things that this painting uh, is sort of showing us is what a great painter Velazquez is because I think uh, when we were looking at the Caravaggio painting and I was talking about the glass of water that he has, I uh, referred to those um, the, the, the painting of the glass of water as a sort of conceit or concetto. And that's what Caravaggio does in uh, Boy Being Bitten by a Lizard, and we'll look at that in a little bit. And here the same thing is going on in terms of Velazquez's painting. So this is one of the very first paintings early in his career that we that we know of, and it's probably one of the paintings that, that earned him a little bit of fame. So he goes and he works at the court of Philip IV. And uh, let's take a look at, at what happens when he gets there. This painting that we're looking at, Las Meninas, also called the Maids of Honor from much later, remember the other painting was about 1620 or 1619 or so. This is uh, many years after, and it's after he's been working at the court uh, with the king for, for many years. And so uh, you need some more biographical data to really understand how important this painting is and what it represents for Velazquez in terms of its symbolism. So let's talk about that first, and then we can do a little bit more of a, a physical or formal analysis. Velazquez actually becomes really good friends with the king, and uh, he has been promoted several times at, at, at one point in his life. He even becomes the keeper of the king's bedroom, which sounds like a sort of weird thing to us, but basically what it means is he um, is awarded a stipend, uh, and uh, he is the person who's in charge of organizing some parties for the king and making sure that the king's bedroom has all the linens and, and the staff that takes care of the king's private chambers. And the king also um, has allowed Velazquez, and this is something that has never been done before, the king, when he hires him, um, actually gives Velazquez some um, as, uh, apartments and a studio in, in basically the palace. And so he is awarded by the king a uh, working space in the palace. And um, at one point, there's like this little story about Velazquez um, is painting a portrait of, of Philip, and Philip says to him, uh, you know, more or less, you know, you've been accused of only being able to paint heads. And Velazquez says to the king, um, I'm not even sure I can do that very well. And that kind of gives you an idea of, of how intelligent this guy was and how humble he was, that he was also really astute at knowing how to speak to people and, and understood his place. And so the king you know, likes him that much and, and sort of gives him these extra honors. And at one point, the king actually sends him on a trip to Italy. And, and Velazquez met Peter Paul Rubens, the, uh, the Flemish diplomat who was also working for the French court uh, while he was in uh, Philip's court. And uh, they actually took a, a trip to Italy together. And the king asked um, Velazquez to go and basically collect art for him in Italy. All that kind of ties together in this painting. And I've gotten different uh, or conflicting stories about where this painting is located, uh, meaning the, the setting. Uh, one of my teachers, Professor Broderick, suggested that this was the King's Library and it would have been his art collection um, in, um, I think, El Escorial. Um, and I've also come up with other um, sources that have said that this might be Velazquez's studio. And the interpretations of this painting are also very varied, so I guess there aren't clear primary texts that explain what's going on it. But I'll try to do an analysis for you, and we'll figure out what is being depicted here. So from a formal point of view, first of all, you can see that there's a raking light from the upper right-hand corner from the window on the right-hand side. And this raking light that's moving across the, the painting creates a strong diagonal and sort of a zigzag pattern running through. In the very center of the composition is the Infanta Margarita, which is the king's daughter. And she is uh, sort of spotlit, the tenebrism, all the light, all the, the compositional elements sort of 
uh, converge on her and make her almost the center of the attention. Above her and uh, in that little square to the left, there's this sort of foggy little picture. Uh, and we think that might be a depiction, well, we know it's a depiction of Philip and his wife. And um, it might be a reflection, and we'll get into that in a little bit. So it could be a painting, it could be a, uh, actually a mirror or reflection. Although if it was a, a mirror reflection, it's done in an inaccurate way and therefore in a very symbolic way. We notice that there's a lot of earth tones, and this painting is very large. It's 10 by 9 feet, more or less. And it has a multi-layering in terms of the composition, the foreground, the, the thing furthest forward is actually that dog in the foreground. And then we have on the right-hand side uh, these two figures. One of them is a female dwarf. Uh, the, the kid who's kicking the dog um, could be a dwarf or could be a, a, another child. Then we move back, and Infanta Margarita has on the left and the right-hand sides of her uh, the maids of honor, who are basically you know, her attendants. And then there are some clergy. There, uh, there's a nun and I think a cardinal or a priest who's sort of in the middle ground. On the left-hand side, sort of almost in the middle ground, sort of uh, just, behind the pic just behind the level that Margarita is, is Velasquez painting the portrait, and we can see on the left-hand side, there's actually the back of his canvas facing us. And then spotlit in that doorway is the, um, I was taught by Professor Broderick that that's actually the king's treasure. When I looked at my notes, that what I, that's what I had from undergrad. Um, but uh, one of the other sources, Tim Marlowe, there's a great video by him. It's a 20-minute video, and I think you can get it on Netflix. Of um, it, it could be the king's sort of, um, the keeper of the of the accounts and also the basically the house manager of the court. So he was basically sort of the person who oversaw um, how the the palace was kept. And it's kind of interesting. I like the idea that it might be the the treasurer because he has a sort of halo of light around him. So let's analyze it a little bit more in depth and talk a little bit more about what's going on in terms of this painting, in terms of the iconography, because I think that some of that stuff is really relevant in how we uh, are thinking about this painting. So we have a room. We don't know if it's the library or if it's actually uh, Velasquez's studio, and we see Velasquez painting. And we're not really sure what all that means, but let me go through the traditional interpretation of it. Um, you know, what, what my professors have suggested that it's sort of a smoke and mirrors kind of game. The three pictures on the right hand side of the screen actually sort of depict what we think might be going on in the picture that that mirror that I made reference to that's to, sort of just to the left of uh, Margarita's head is actually a reflection of the king and the queen. And that what is happening in this painting is Velazquez is painting a portrait of the king and the queen. And that sort of corresponds to the lower right hand image and uh, those sort of those cut out figures are Velazquez looking at the king and the queen and therefore sort of symbolically the king and the queen are outside and in front of the picture plane and they come first. So that might be, uh, even though the mirror would be irrational, it wouldn't work optically like that, it's a way of representing the king and the queen and that Velazquez is actually painting them. And that if there's a narrative attached to this, a sort of story, that means the Infanta Margarita, Margarita is walking into uh, the king and the queen's presence, and she's watching them posing for Velazquez. And so Velazquez has just taken a moment to stop and, and look um, at them as he's painting. And that cross on Velazquez's chest, uh, I think it's the Maltese cross, is actually a symbol of Velazquez being knighted. So he was actually Sir Velazquez in the Spanish court, and basically he was knighted for being um, accomplishments in the arts. And you know, if you think about what usually knights get uh, knighted for, at least in the Middle Ages, it would be for military prowess. And so this is kind of interesting because it, it, it almost sets a precedent where we have artists are such superstars during the Baroque era that they get knighted. and. Uh, the extension of that is that we have Sir John Gielgud and, and um, Elton John has even been knighted, I think, uh, in, in England. So, uh, and Paul McCartney, was he knighted? I think he was. So it's a way of giving someone some sort of honor 
for other accomplishments other than mil military accomplishments. Other interpretations or other readings of this painting are that it's basically the Spanish court in Velazquez is sort of depicting um, him just working in the studio and therefore the king and the queen are sort of almost these uh, these ever-present kinds of people that are in the mirror behind. And I like the idea of looking at it that the guy in the very background has this halo and he's uh, in my mind the treasurer of the, uh, of the um, court. Other characters in this, and I think kind of it sets up a hierarchy regardless of that, Marguerite is in the center, and Velazquez is also one of the most visible. And an interesting component is the dwarf in the lower right-hand corner, and we would refer to dwarves today as little people. That's, that's a little bit more correct in how um, little people would prefer to be referred to. We're important in the Spanish court. And the reason why uh, little people were important in the Spanish court was basically because they were brought in as jesters. And as jesters, they were objects of, of sort of humor and derision in a way. But because they became, um, they're so non-threatening, a lot of them, and Velazquez paints a lot of, of uh, little people in his court, um, he paints them in a very humanizing way. And because they actually had some sway and some influence and they were real people because nobody was really threatened by them, but they were privy to a lot of information and a lot of knowledge. I think that the dog in the lower right-hand corner might represent fidelity. And remember, we studied um, the images of dogs in paintings like, for instance, in the Arnolfini wedding portrait. There's a dog in that painting that I believe Panofsky sort of um, incorrectly identified as being a symbol of fidelity standing between the two figures. We also have a little dog in Titian's Venus of Rubino. And that little dog, of course, uh, for some of my teachers, said that that dog is a representation of fidelity as well. But what I suspect from reading some uh, biographies and from a little historical background is dogs were often used to draw the fleas supposedly off of people because they didn't have flea control at that point in time. And you would keep a dog actually to get the fleas out of your clothing because it would be more attracted to the dog than you. In this instance, this is a big kind of powerful looking dog. And, and, uh, and I think Philip, there are lots of hunting scenes of Philip and he would have had hunting dogs as well. And dogs were sort of um, a symbol of fidelity and friendliness. Then in the shadows, as we move back into the picture, um, you have these clergy members that are sort of in the middle ground and, and they're almost like watching <laughs> their, their sort of presence on the borders of, of things. And then in the very background, we have the mirror and we have the, uh, the treasure. So those might be some interpretations of how to read this painting and how to think about it. A nice comparison to do uh, to understand how Velazquez builds on Caravaggio's boy being bitten by a lizard from about 1600. Caravaggio is an Italian painter. And how um, by the 1620s, that style has become so prevalent is a, a little comparison of these two things. And what you can do is when you look at these two paintings, I want you to take a look at them in terms of the chiaroscuro, the tenebrism, the patterns of light and shadow, the composition, and even some little things like, why is that glass of water or those, those little vessels of water painted? And who is being painted in these things? Because I think you'll see that Velazquez has a slightly different attitude towards painting than Caravaggio does. And uh, so just take a moment for yourself and pull these two paintings up on the internet, spend some time comparing and contrasting them. And I think you'll come up with your own conclusions about why Velazquez is a Caravaggisti. <laughs>